Hi everyone, so I work at FK in South Africa in Cape Town and we actually have quite a lot of opportunities in our positions to, um, to teach. So I'm going to speak a little bit about the various contexts that we teach in and then describe some of the ways we teach in those contexts. Um, first using iPython, just vanilla iPython, and then using the notebook. I'll spend more time on the notebook and, um, and then at the end do a bit of a, a slightly risky web-based live demo of some really cool stuff. Cool, so, okay, so the first two contexts uh, that we've been teaching in are Kenya and Namibia in Nairobi and Winter. And um, the reason that we work there is that our project is actually a pan-African project. Although most of the South African SK telescopes are going to be in South Africa, we're actually going to have a few in other African countries. Um, so in the lead up to that, we've been working with them, with some university students, and doing some radio astronomy and astronomy tutorials there. So I'll speak about that first. And then I'll get to speaking about some of the um, teaching that we do closer to home more routinely um, in Cape Town. Um, okay, so Kenya and Namibia, we run these things called data workshops, which stands for Joint Exchange and Development Initiative, which is a style of workshop pioneered by some guys at AIM in um, the African Institute of Mathematical Sciences in Cape Town. Um, the most recent one is actually a machine learning one. You can see the link there if you're interested. But it's just a style of workshop that's meant to be very flexible and very reactive to participants' needs. So you can change things kind of on the fly if you realize you, maybe your students have different backgrounds to what you expect. Or if you're working with a bunch of academics, they have different skill sets and what you expect or whatever. Um, so in both of these cases, we had uh, groups of about 12 to 15 students and 30 and above. Um, Vintuk, uh, they were slightly like younger. Um, Namibia, the picture over there is Hess and Namibia, the students. They were slightly um, more advanced students. And in these, in these contexts, we use just our Python. It's just our Python vanilla. So we developed a tutorial that was Python from the ground up, assuming a little bit of computer science um, background, but no Python. And the eventual aim was to get them towards astronomy, radio astronomy related tools. Um, they were given a physical handout to follow, so they actually had to do the themselves in the terminal and work in little groups. Um, and the tutorial was specifically designed to make, force them to use the iPython half a lot, so they're familiar with that, and to actually have errors embedded in the tutorial so that they could also get used to debugging their own code. So here's an example of a page from it. It's just, this is a section where we were showing them how to use some math.lib um, tools and the assignment in the section was to reproduce a figure from an academic paper. So the plot there is just the figure that they have to reproduce. So overall, this actually worked remarkably well, especially in Kenya. Um, the use of the iPad and help was really very empowering for them. One of my favorite moments in Kenya was when we were, we kind of let them work and then circulate around the room and um, kind of see how things are going. And I went to one group of students who were obviously stuck and I offered them some help and they said, no, 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 we're reading the help, we'll figure it out. And that never happens, students never do that. So that was actually amazing. I don't know if it's the Kenyan students were amazing or that our tutorial was amazing, I don't know. Um, but yeah, that was pretty cool. Um, and the other real win of, of using iPython rather than uh, teaching them to write their own scripts and giving them scripts to, to uh, edit which is what is often traditionally the way these things are done. Um, is that because it's interactive, and it's an interactive Python, um, you get this quick feedback loop where students get something wrong or don't understand something, or get an error message, then have to figure out how to, how to fix that, and then fix it, and then get back to the, the, uh, the rest of the tutorial, carry on, find an error, fix it. And going through that loop very quickly and easily um, repeatedly is incredibly empowering. It teaches them to actually fix their own code, which is unusual for students. So, so that worked very well. And it's also much easier for tutors. So there were only actually two tutors for a class of 12 to 15 students. So you don't want to be spending your time hacking away from reading someone's awful, you know, first time passing programming script. Um, in our class, it's much easier. You just have to go through a few lines and, and quite quickly see the variables up. That was a big um, win. And the next one, which is my favorite one, was sort of discovery through experimentation. Um, and it, it's really because of all of this, 
um, students are, will much more willing to try things. So try different functions or fiddle with parameters and actually themselves teach themselves, um, which is really how everyone learns ultimately, you're teaching yourself not just by listening um, to someone tell you what to do. So that was a big win of, of using this method. The two main challenges, which are going to come up again and again, are number one, Linux proficiency, and um, most of them had never used Linux before. And uh, so working in the terminal posed some challenges and setting things up posed some challenges. And I've written here standardization slash versioning, which I've used as a sort of umbrella term for the problems you get when people are using their own systems and they're all different and you spend a million years um, trying to get the right version between all the people's computers. Um, in Namibia, we use virtual machines, but even that was problematic because Washington had old laptops and uh, things would just grind to a halt. So there were just a whole lot of problems related to actually um, everyone using their own systems. Um, right, so CypherCat, um, so, okay, so that was like uh, working in an African partner country. Now I'm moving closer to home. Um, there's sort of two styles of uh, uh, teaching that we do out of our office. The first is a called SKA class and tutorial. So this is when uh, um, often a university will come to us and say, we want you to run an afternoon long tutorial on radio astronomy for our students, or maybe we'll have interns. In this picture over here, this is something called the Youth Development Program, where something like 20 students came to our office for a few days and learned about what to do, and we need to present them with some material. And we use our class and notebook for this. Um, we put it all together in a suite of tutorials which you can um, get to at the bottom if you're interested and I'll do some demonstrations on them later. Um, the second main teaching conference we have is a course that we run at the University of Cape Town in radio astronomy for um, honours level students. It's called NAS, which is the National Astronomy, National Astrophysics and Space Science. Um, that's a picture of the, the current NAS class sitting on the top of the Hotchard Basic Radio Telescope. Um, and in this content, it's sort of more traditional lecturing and tutoring, so actually standing in front of the class and exams and, uh, you know, the whole university dad. Okay, so to explain how we've used the notebook in these various different contexts, I made a little graph, sort of my, my attempt at an SKCD style classification graph. Um, so, what this is is a graph of the emphasis of your notebook. So the x-axis is the emphasis on Python, using Python and Python skills. The y-axis is the emphasis on some kind of discipline-specific content, so machine learning or radio astronomy or bioinformatics or whatever. So right at the bottom is just a straight Python tutorial, so that's what it would be if we um, took our Python notebooks that we use, I mean our Python and vanilla that we use in Kenya, just translated into a notebook. One up from that is something that I call the content slash Python lab. And that's the classification um, that I use for the way I use the notebook to teach the Fourier transforms for, uh, section of the NAS, recent NAS course. And in that case, the overall content that I wanted to get to the students for the Fourier transforms, uh, varying applications and whatnot. Um, but I also needed them to learn how to use the notebook. And I needed them to learn how to use Python a little bit because I was very unfamiliar with Python at that stage. And I wanted them to become um, comfortable using the Python Fourier transform packages so that they could go on and do that themselves. So there was content, but there was also quite a lot of emphasis in using Python, which meant that my Python code was exposed to them and there wasn't any hiding of things. I actually wanted them to use the code and learn how it was used. Moving my app is something that I call the content tutorial, which is what we use in our short, few hour long tutorials, um, where the main emphasis is exposing people to radio astronomy ideas and our data from the Cat Theory Telescope. Um, so there's a little bit of um, exposure and introduction to NumPy, but beyond that, it's mostly the data. Moving my app is what we call interactive lecture notes. And this is a new thing that we just started in the NAS course, which is actually really quite interesting, where you actually um, put together all of your lecture your, your content inside the notebook, um, which you can do because of the markdown and later capability. It probably seems kind of like overkill, why would you do that? 
But what is really cool about doing it that way is that it means that all the worst examples and the plots in your um, course content can then be interactive. So a student can go, on, go, go along to um, some rather math mathematical worst example and plot is immediate steps if they want, um, change variables if they want, actually score things in the, um, in the lecture notes, which is really cool. Obviously, you can't you know, do that in a PDF. Obviously not. <laughs> um, and finally, the top one is something that we haven't used, but I've seen used. Um, I've called it a package content tutorial. So say, for example, you want to teach a bioinformatics course, but um, you don't want your uh, participants to worry about any Python. So you make a package around that that makes things as simple as possible and um, to run things in the notebook because they're not having to worry about um, almost anything. It's just a few simple functions that they can add things to. And I've seen people do that online for courses in um, sort of advanced numerical systems, that kind of thing. Okay, so the simplest case for us running a notebook would be um, a computer lab, say at UCT, where all the computers are the same, everyone has their iPad and notebook, um, in their home directory, they can run a little work through it, maybe with us talking, talking through a little bit. Um, even in this completely simple case, there's uh, two chances. The first is Linux, which you see again, lots of students haven't used Linux much before, or if they have, they've been using Ubuntu and they've only ever clicked, they haven't actually used the terminal. Um, the second thing is this issue of standardization slash version again. You know, even in a computer lab where everything is the same, we found that um, we were developing the notebooks in more recent versions and we were using magics and widgets that weren't backward compatible with the horrible notebook 2 in the lab and then we have to dig the system administrator to change things and it's all slow and blah blah blah. So even in that simple case there's issues with that. Um, but in the more complex case when our students are bringing their laptops and wanting to do assignments on their laptops and so on, it, those same kind of problems in the of having to install things and all that happens with that and it taps into your class time and um, sort of fighting with those kind of things. So what I'm going to do is talk through some of the tools that we use and can potentially be used to get around those problems. Um, so the first is GitHub, okay, it's not a Python tool, but it plays really nicely with some of the other tools. Um, and our tutorials are now all on GitHub. Um, the second is going to called NVIDIA, which is a a free web service that gives you static versions of notebooks. Uh, the third is cloud computing in a couple of different contexts which I'll go into more in a moment. Um, the last two are run iPy and MV convert. You really saw MV convert in terms of run iPy just runs through a notebook in, in the terminal uh, without having to open a browser. Um, MV convert can convert your notebook into various formats. The way I use these two is that students would submit assignments as iPython notebooks and then um, rather than having to open each one in a browser and try to do everything, I would just run it from the terminal, convert it to PDF. I know this is bad, but I would then print it out and mark it on the print out and hand it back to them. I know that's bad, but <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how you mark it. <laughs> I'm sure you can figure out a way to mark on, on a notebook, but I haven't yet, so that's how I use those things. Okay, so some of the ways that we use some of these tools. Um, have your iPython notebook in GitHub, and then all of that works very well with NVIDIA. I'll give you an example now. Um, in fact, let me give you the example. So, here are our tutorials. So, let us, so our tutorials are all in SKSA slash tutorials. So, here is NVIDIA. SKSA tutorials. Edit, please work, internet. Yes. And there we go, and we can browse through static versions of our tutorials very easily. Um, I'll go through the tutorials um, themselves. We'll talk in a moment. But you can browse through them and see static versions of them like this. And this can be useful for a couple of reasons, let's look at radiometers. radiometers. So this is an example of lecture notes that are actually written in the notebook. With some interactive flashing that then you can go change things. 
And this is useful because you can lecture from something like this for one, and for two, you can run it without actually having an iPad and notebook running on the computer anymore. So if you're in the lab that you're using a Windows machine um, and you need to show someone something in a, a notebook, you don't actually have to have, um, you know, to have an iPad and running. Okay, next set of cool tools. Okay, so now we're moving to the cloud. When we run tutorials where a whole lot of students come to our office, they'll bring their laptops and sit them in a room and we'll um, run an app like the server on one of our machines and they'll all just log into that um, and run the notebook themselves. Uh, the first time we did this, we didn't realize that obviously we actually need to have copies of all the notebooks for the students, so that was a bit of a hack. Um, but we subsequently got a bit smarter and now we make a separate folder for each student and check out our tutorials in each folder. So that already worked actually amazingly well because it means 15 students from the you know, University of the SNK <laughs> can all bring their own laptops, can be running whatever um, on that laptop, but they can all do the tutorial. And it's actually almost ridiculously easier than any other method we could have to do this. I mean, we don't have to have our own machines, we don't have to tell them to set up things, we saw things beforehand. It's really pretty awesome. Um, next level of awesomeness is you can set up the same thing on an Amazon Web Services EC2 instance, which we've done, um, and then we can use that in sort of a more portable way, so wherever you go, you can run that. Um, and we did that by setting up a little fabric, uh, you know, automatic deployment, so everything that's needed as dependencies for our tutorials, you can automatically put on an Amazon Web Services instance, and then uh, we, have, we have something quite easy to use for people. Um, here's an example of a running Amazon Web Service instance. Uh, so this is how we would do it. So our students would just literally uh, navigate to that, okay, from cutting and pasting from an email or something. And we'd open the folder. I'm Laura Ruchter, so I open that folder. And here are all the tutorials that I'm, I can do. It. This is the single dish. one that uh, provides a bit of an introduction to NumPy and then and then gets further down to actually um, working with some of our H5 H5 data from first from the single one of our early single antennas and make them in the next tutorial in the section um, some of our test data. So this is this is already pretty awesome. It means you don't have to worry about a lot of stuff you have to worry about before. And also you don't have to worry in this context about um, students line of all because all I have to do is copy, I mean, uh, shift into through a notebook. They don't have to actually do anything Linux related. Um, and the next the next level of amazing is something that I only discovered a few weeks ago. So I the star is because I haven't actually tested this for students. So maybe it won't work, but I have great hope for it because I think it's amazing. So it's Sage Maptar, it's uh, Wakari, the same great the same thing. I just I just find Sage Maptar um, less laggy and uh, uh, much more user friendly, so I recommend it. Um, and I'll, um, I'll show you an example of it now. But this takes away pretty much every problem we, we have had, so it's amazing. Um, so let me show you. Now, and can you imagine, the, the, the context you imagine is, say you have a class of you know, 100 Math 1 students, you want to give them an assignment, you know, our class notebook, you do not want to have to hack around with 100, you know, making 100 folders and some server that has enough, you know, power for that, blah, blah, blah. So you just tell them all to create your own Sage Math account. So let us create a Sage Math account. So here is our temporary Sage Math account email address. Yeah. I think that the, the, the Sage Math has about about fifteen um, <laughs> gorilla mail uh, accounts at the moment. Um, so here is a uh, Python a email address. So 
There's our account that took one second. Um, we got a project. We created a new project. So Sage Map Cloud, um, it's a cloud service that was specifically um, designed for Sage Map, which was meant to be a, um, an open source alternative to MATLAB. But it's also recently um, been set up to be very uh, user friendly for notebooks, Apache notebooks, and to have all the packages that you would need pretty much useful. So it already has NumPy and SciPy and uh, MacBook and H5Py and a myriad of other things. And the guys who, who run this project are also incredibly responsive if you want them to install other things. Okay, so let us. So here are our students. We tell them that we want them to use this set of tutorials on their Sage Math Cloud project. New. I mean, that, uh, you know, in two seconds I pulled that up. A student could do this in the first five seconds of a lecture rather than the experience we had where, you know, the first half an hour of the first lecture is, sh you know, showing them how to do things and showing them how to use the terminal and blah, blah, blah. This is wonderful. And it, it can be used in a very simple way by students who don't have a lot of the experience, but there's also features that can make, uh, that can allow you to use it in a much more sophisticated way. Um, so you can, if you want, pull a terminal app. And it's a, um, you know, you can work in the terminal if you want. This is where, if you wanted to install stuff, you could clone stuff out here and, and work here. And there's also uh, uh, LaTeX that you can work on LaTeX documents. And you can also work on collaborative projects with this. So if you wanted to, you could have three people have uh, all working on the same same project and then working on the same workshop, which is cool. I haven't needed that feature yet, but, um, but I think it could potentially be quite awesome. Um, oh, so actually, maybe I should show you actually. So say, so say we want to add um, PyFM. So PyFM is a, um, it's for astronomy, uh, very, uh, very accurate astronomy related software tools. So say, so, uh, so the math card doesn't ac currently have Five few minutes, so let's get to it from just from the terminal. We could we could have done this from the the cut and paste block again. Uh, so there we have it. Oh, that was a oh that was a really messy way to do that. Oh well. Um, living the dream. Okay, so an evaluation of our use of the notebook. The two challenges, I think the main one, especially when we were first using it, is not budgeting enough in introductory and setup time, sort of thinking it would be obvious to the students, you know, once you've said shift enter to them once, and once you've explained um, some of the shortcuts once, 
but actually it took them a bit more time, so we should have spent more time on that, um, especially on the context where they're working on their own laptops and that sort of thing. And I put standardization version again because it was a problem in our original attempt to the notebook, but with these, uh, these newer tools, we, we're, we're actually almost past that. We can almost completely um, avoid those problems. The wins, there are so many of them, pretty much all of the iPython wins, and then the fact that it's browser-based, anyone can use it, cross-platform, everything in one context, which is very good for teaching. You don't have, you know, you pop to one place, your code, and a, and a text editor, it's all there. Um, less necessity for Linux expertise, almost no necessity for Linux expertise in some context. It's very convenient for assignments. I think the students that I work with at least are not quite happy um, doing and submitting assignments in, in a notebook, which is also easier to mark than a script, because everything is there, the output is there, all in one thing. And markdown and data means that we can actually write notes and whole lecture and um, you know, coursework in the, no the notebook in an interactive way, which is really cool. And this issue that I spoke about um, for the, the iPad and vanilla of sort of describing through experimentation, teaching like this really lends itself to that. Um, I know for the, for the Fourier transform section, after a while, students were quite happy fiddling with different um, functions, combining them in different ways, um, and realizing that changing things didn't break things. It was just a way, to, way for them to explore. That was actually incredibly empowering for them, which makes us a really good tool. So here are some of the uh, course evaluation notes from the students, obviously only the nice ones. And <laughs> um, yeah. I resisted the urge to correct the grammar. So I thought that was quite good. There was obviously a good response. Um, and I think they really enjoy doing it. And I think as we get more used to um, used to teaching with it, and as we get more used to using the newer tools, it's actually just going to become a better and better experience for them. Um, and finally, this is just an idea I had that I thought I might as well share before I, before I end. Um, about a year ago, when I first started doing the the Python tutorial that we ran, the sort of just afternoon based one with the, the few students coming in with their own laptops, um, it occurred to me that. The iPad notebook would be a really cool way to supplement high school syllabus work, like in, in uh, science, in obviously computer science, and in math. So I thought, oh, well, let me try that. You know, let me try and make the notebooks. And I uh, spoke to a friend at the school and kind of got that organized. And then after getting it organized, I realized I would have to do it on a school computer lab, which would run Windows and I'd have to install stuff, and I was just, ah, oh, I just couldn't bring myself to do it, so I gave up. Um, but then I just discovered all these amazing new tools, like SageMath, which I think could work so incredibly well on this context. Um, so I think that that would be something really worth doing. If anyone would like to, it may be if someone's already doing that, or if anyone would be interested in putting together a bit of a suite of um, high school support notebooks, and then maybe trying them out in a couple of tools, I would really like to do that. So if you want to, then you can find something like that. So, yeah, thank you.